Thank you, Dustin. Yeah, so we've been in this series called The Two Trees, and if you're wondering what, are we, what two trees you're talking about, uh, in Genesis 2 and 3, we see that in the very beginning, God planted two trees in the garden, in the center of the Garden of Eden. And one, which is represented by this stool here, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve were told that this is the tree they should not eat of, and if they do eat of it, that they would surely die. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we, we tend to think about it as like a tree of rebellion. Like it's like, oh, me just going my own way, doing my own thing. And, and, that, and that's part of it. Our friend Bob Hamp said it this way, that in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there is both a evil branch and a good branch. And how many of you know that you can have good but not have life? And another way to think about it is in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there is a rebellious branch. Everybody knows what rebellion is. It means going your own way against God. But there's also a religious branch. And by religious, I mean this. It's our pursuit of our own self-righteousness. It's us trying to make our way to God instead of recognizing that God came to us. When we look at the, it's the story that I referenced with Robert just a few minutes ago in Luke chapter 15, the story that we call the prodigal son, I like to call it the story of the good father. We see two sons. One son's rebellious. He takes his inheritance, spends it on his own stuff, and goes his own way and is pretty wild from what we understand. The other son, the older brother, stays home and does everything that he's supposed to do and yet he doesn't understand that he is a son. And so he, he lives, he's a, he's a good picture. Jesus was talking to the religious leaders of his day. He's a good picture of what religion is. It's to do all of the right things and yet to miss life, to miss the heart of God. So over here, we have the tree of life. And in the, the tree of life, this is what sonship is all about. This is what we were created for. This is Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the full. This is what Adam and Eve were meant to live in and walk in. In life, it's about walking with God. I'm not performing for him. Instead, I am a co-laborer with him and I have everything that he has. I'm a son, not because I earned it, but because I have been adopted into his family by the blood of Jesus, by the death of Jesus. And so... When the prodigal son comes home, what he finds is that his father has always been waiting and watching for him, and he comes in and he brings him into the house, throws a wild party, puts a robe of honor, a robe of righteousness on him, puts sandals on his feet, which means this, that he's a son, because slaves and servants didn't get sandals, sons wore sandals, and then put a a ring on his finger, and that ring is the, the ring of authority that gave him the ability to do business in his father's name, in his family name. That's a big deal for the son that has squandered everything. So you may feel like, hey, I've been rebellious against God. I've done my own thing, and I'm really trying hard to live a right and good life. And the temptation of religion, there is this spirit called the spirit of religion, and it tries to pull you into trying to perform for God. That's what it's doing, and it's saying, if I can just do enough good to make up for the bad that I've done, then I'll be okay. That's not the gospel. That's not the way that the kingdom of God works. Instead, while we were still sinners, while we were still a mess, whether it was in a mess in the way of our own striving and good performance or our own rebellion against God, doing damage to other people, all of that stuff, it says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? That you cannot get yourself out of this tree, out of this way of life. Instead, you receive it as a gift, and we become adopted into God's family, sons and daughters, all right? That's really good news because living as a child of God is not about my performance. It's about my yieldedness to his life in mine, and everything flows from that place. That's really good news. So here's the challenge of humanity. Let me tell you a story. One of my brothers... Uh, 
was with some other folks and one of his kids was acting up and from the story I got, he yelled at his kid and it wasn't a pretty sight. Parents, have you ever done that? It's been like, oh man. And his response to the folks around him was, wow, I thought I was more saved than that. <laughs> have you ever had a response to a situation, something that like comes out of you and you're like, oh man, I thought I was better off than that. I thought God's work in my life was better than that. If I was really saved, then there's no way I would have done that. You've been there? I think Kenny's, Kenny's there right now. He's actually lying. <laughs> Elders that lie. We're in trouble around here. Um, no, you, we've been there before. And so here, here's the thing that we have to understand. Because the enemy would want you to think that every time you mess, it, mess up, whether you miss it really big or you miss it really small, that, oh, man, you're not really saved. You're not, you don't really belong to God. You're not really a home for the Holy Spirit. You, you've moved back into rebellion and religion and performance and trying to do your own thing. The, the challenge, let me, let me read this to you. It's actually about you. You guys are nervous. It's actually good news. It's in uh, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. This is God prophesying through Ezekiel on what would happen when Jesus would come. So future tense for them, past tense for us. It says, I will give you a new heart. Whoa, that's good news. I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. That's what Jesus did. It's past tense, what God has done in our lives. Paul writes about it several times this way. He says that you are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So what does that mean for us? What about those moments when we're like, oh, I thought I was doing good, but I'm not as saved as I thought I was. I had this thing go on. What's happening? Does it mean that I have a bad heart now? Did I, did I blow it? Am I enemies with God? Am I, what, what's happening in me? Have you ever wondered that? Like, why do I struggle if I've already been saved, if God's already working in me, if he's already given me a new heart? Let me say it to you this way. The promise of the gospel is a new heart, not necessarily a new mind. You see, we get a, a new heart that's a free gift. And yet what we're challenged to do, actually, let me say it this way better, what we're invited to do is to renew our mind. And, and when we realize, oh, I've got a new heart but an old mind, then I understand the invitation to partner with God to renew my mind so that I begin to be transformed, that I begin to think like him, that I begin to think with him. Romans 12.2 says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. There's a, a way of living that the world lives in. in. In our day, there's all sorts of different patterns of this world. Uh, in our current political season, it, it's living by identity politics and making enemies out of our neighbors and then thinking that we're just in doing it. There's all sorts of patterns. So it says, don't be transformed by the patterns of this world or don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what does it mean to be transformed and how do I renew my mind? Let me walk you through what that looks like because I think this is such a key to living in the tree of life. Let me say it this way. It's the key for you living with God and living from being with God, living out your purpose that God has created you for. So first, let's look at the word Trans, or, uh, yeah, be transformed. 
The word transformed there is the same word that's used on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you don't know that story, Jesus invites uh, Peter, James, and John up the mountain with him, and he's going to meet uh, with two uh, prophets of old, and something significant happens to Jesus. He begins to glow. It's like he becomes white, like he's like this glowing, radiating thing. It's like what happened to Moses' face when he went up Mount Sinai, but it actually happened to all of Jesus. And in that moment, what those three were able to see in Jesus is they saw Jesus as he really is. They saw beyond the flesh. That word for what Jesus was doing That word is the word transfigured, and it's the same word that talks about us being transformed by the renewing of our mind. But here's the key to understanding that word. The word in the Greek means transformed as a result of being with. You see, when we live in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... I'm trying to change myself by myself so that I can have life. Let me take my thoughts captive. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let me just try really, really hard to get it right and to do good so that maybe God will like me and be pleased with me. And then maybe even he'll let his spirit rest on me. And maybe, maybe I can pray and see people healed and see the Holy Spirit touch people's lives if I'm really, really good. But the gospel is this, I am a son, and when I say yes to Jesus, I get a new heart. That speaks uh, of who I am, but it doesn't necessarily speak of all of my behavior. You see, one of my greatest joys is raising kids, and I'm in their lives One, because I love them. They're just absolutely delightful and a handful, but delightful. (laughs) But I really enjoy being with them, and I love the stages that they're at, uh, 11, 7, and 4. It's just a blast. But I don't want to stay here. Like, I cherish every minute of it. Those of you who who have raised kids, and they're gone, and you're like, don't miss every minute. There are some minutes that I do want to miss, but I'm... Most of it I cherish. But my, I understand that they're not who they will be. They're not in the fullest expression of their identity. And so I'm in the story of their lives with them, helping them become who, at their core, God created them to be. And that's what God is doing with us. And we often are like, oh, I don't have it all together. I must be living here. I'm such a mess. And then we get into spiritual environments. And spiritual environments sometimes can mess, mess us up a little bit when, when they miss the heart of the gospel that we're adopted as God's kids. Because here's what happens. We begin to think, And in one realm of of spiritual, religious environments, we begin to think this, that I just need to do a lot of good. And so we start trying to do good, and good things, by the way, good things that are on God's heart, like taking care of the poor and the homeless, the orphan and the widow, all of those things. And we're just trying to kind of tip the scale so that we can have more good than bad. And so, so you've got spiritual environments that are really all about operating in the natural realm and doing good. And then you have spiritual environments that recognize that there's more going on than just the natural realm, there's also the spiritual realm. And in the spiritual realm, we begin to think in terms of Let me say it this way. I'll have to unpack it. Just I want to bring you along. I don't want to leave anybody behind. But we begin to think in terms of visitation instead of habitation. 
And the idea of visitation is this. Is if I'm really good, if I really pray a lot, if I do a lot of holy and spiritual things and I abstain from the evil things, then God will visit me. Then God will anoint me, then he'll bless me, then he'll do what I want, then he'll answer my prayers. And the, the challenge of that is that it's still dependent on your behavior. And so your faith is actually not in the person of Jesus. Your faith is still in your own performance. And then what happens, like I said last week, Colossians says that we're enemies of God within our own minds. And so we begin to war with God in our heads, and we put our faith in our faith, and we then begin to think, oh, if I'm really good, God moves. If I'm really bad, he doesn't move, and somehow him moving is something to do with me. But when I live here, Right? So I'm transformed by being with him. My kids are not transformed by a list of rules. They're not transformed simply by instruction. Eli learned to swim a couple nights ago in the pool without floaties on. So big. I could have told him everything to do. Could have given him all of the instruction. Son, this is how you swim and this is what you do. I'll be standing on the edge and if you really need me, then I'll rescue you. I could have given him all of that stuff. None of that would have allowed him to grow into swimming. He needed dad in the water with him so that he could swim to me. Are you with me? That's what this is. I'm transformed. I grow. I become what I was always meant to be by being with God. So I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. What does that mean? Well, it, it means to make an old thing new. Here's, here's the crazy thing. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us this, that we have the mind of Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing, and you'll hear this a lot in some, some religious circles. People say, well, oh, no ear, can hear, no eye has seen what God is going to do. It actually quotes that in 1 Corinthians 2. And then it says this. It's so good. It says, but, but, and what it's saying is, but that's not true for you and I because we have the mind of Christ. Oh, so you've been given something, you've been given access to something that you are invited and being raised by God into. So you've got... When you say yes to Jesus, you get a new heart, but you're learning to renew your mind. But learning to renew your mind is not performing for God hoping to get here. It's actually being with him so that you can become like him. And so then from that place of being with him, I process life with him. And that's how I renew my mind. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, you can go there just for a second. It's in the New Testament, a little bit towards the end after the Gospels. Hey, it's actually after 1 Corinthians. A little bit of Bible trivia to buy myself some time while I'm thumbing there. Did you know that 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is actually 3 Corinthians? They lost a letter somewhere, but I guess we didn't need it. 1 Corinthians, by the way, I meant to say this earlier in 1 Corinthians. If you ever read 1 Corinthians, you're like, whoa. Dad was setting some stuff straight. Like, the Apostle Paul was a spiritual father to the church in Corinth, an apostle. And he was like putting some things in order. And in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, he says this to them. He says, what are you doing? You're living like mere mortals. Oh. Huh. He's like, you guys are acting up and you're acting like you're just humans. You're acting like you don't have the supernatural power of God in you so that you can be and act like God, which is what we were always promised in the beginning. So I sometimes say that to myself. Joel, what are you doing? You're acting like a mere human. First, or 2 Corinthians 10, we'll start in verse 3. We'll probably go to verse 5. I really love the scripture, and so here's what happens. I start somewhere, and I'm like, you guys, you gotta, this is so good. we got to keep going, but I'm going to try to control myself. 
It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Let me just, yeah, this is good for us in a political season. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. And our hope is not in a natural realm and not in the political sphere. Do I want justice and godliness and order in those places? Absolutely. But my hope is in the spiritual realm. And my belief is that the spiritual realm supersedes the political realm and the natural realm. Are you with me? And so we should participate in the natural realm. It's part of seeing God's kingdom come to earth, not in a control way. That's a whole other conversation we'll have later. But it's actually my desire, I think the, the desire of God, that the spiritual realm would influence the political realm. Yes. Right? Yes. But our hope is not in that. There is no political candidate that will die on the cross for you and raise from the dead. Yeah. It's only Jesus. And if you move your hope away from Jesus, you'll be very disillusioned. Yes. That was for free because I'm excited. <laughs> Here's why I'm excited. Because I think... In the middle of all of the political chaos, there's an invitation for the church to actually be the people of God and pursue the kingdom of God. And regardless for how you vote, what if people knew that you belonged to Jesus before they knew who you voted for? And what if they were able to, look, there's going to be a a level of uh, chaos as a result of this election, whichever way it goes. And some people are going to be disappointed and disillusioned and really struggle. And if your candidate wins, how are you going to respond? And if your candidate loses, how are you going to respond? Because the way that you respond shows what your hope is in. And if you can be a blessing to the people around you, regardless of who you vote for, now we'll start to see the kingdom come. And in the moments when the world is the most chaotic, it's the moment that God is inviting the people of God to act like it. And it's in that place that we begin to see people won over to the kingdom of God. How many, many of you would love to see your neighbors, your coworkers, even your kids or parents in the middle of craziness because you respond like Jesus would respond? You would like to see them give their lives to Jesus encounter Jesus through the way that you live. Anyways, it matters. All right, so the weapons we fight are not weapons of this world. Contrary, on the contrary, they are divine, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? It's a fortress, but here's another way to say it. Now, there are good strongholds, David would retreat into a stronghold. The God is, our, God is our stronghold. He's our safe place of refuge. But an evil stronghold is a house of thoughts built on lies. Okay? It, and we become a slave to the lies that we believe. Those lies are often about ourselves, about God, about others, or about our circumstances. You got those four? Ourselves, God, others, and our circumstances. And those are the areas that we need to learn to renew our mind. Here's the way you can find a stronghold. It's interesting that Justin, who, by the way, just has like a gift of leadership dripping all over his life, that he uh, began to go after hope this morning. Because hope is the evidence that you're living free of evil strongholds. Uh, author Francis, Francis Frangipane, it's a great name, uh, Francis said this, that you can identify a stronghold by any area of your life that is not glistening with hope. So hopelessness is the evidence of a stronghold in operation. And so, it's interesting that God is the God of all hope. So you can begin to find where strongholds are operating in your life when you begin to not have hope. When you don't have hope for somebody in your life, it's that somehow a stronghold has begun to mess with you. When you don't have hope for your circumstances, somehow 
There's some lies that you're believing. You've built this house of thought on lies, and it's beginning to hold you captive. We'll dig into a lot more of that at Sozo Weekend. Okay, so on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments or accusations and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge. That's actually, that word there would mean intimate connection knowledge, not head knowledge, knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So here's what we do. If we want to have a transformed mind, but we've got that old mind that we're working with, we begin to take our thoughts captive and we make them obedient to Christ. Let me give you, this is like my uh, life way of operating. I need simplicity. Do you need simplicity? It helps a lot, right? Okay, so Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I know that as a child of God, that I belong to the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, and if you're in Jesus, then so are you. Here's what that means. That that environment of righteousness, peace, and joy is the environment, the culture, the atmosphere that I was meant to live in. That's my inheritance and my right. Okay? Let me define those three as quickly as I can for you. Righteousness, an old covenant perspective, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil perspective, is right living that gets you into right relationship. It's if I perform, now I'm right with God. Righteousness in the new covenant, what Jesus established when he died on the cross, what was established in his blood, we see it in Luke 22, he says, I'm making a new covenant with you. Righteousness there is right relationship that leads to right living. So I'm not performing for God. Instead, I'm abiding in him, like John 15 says, and then I bear fruit out of my abiding. Does that make sense? And so, righteousness, I begin to pay attention, like, when is temptation tempting? When is it alluring? When is it, like, pulling me? Whether it's, like anger or, or greed or lust. When has that thing grabbed a hold of me? And now it's like I'm tempted to go and maybe to some old patterns or maybe even de- develop some new ones. I begin to pay attention to that and realize, oh, something is off. That's not what I was meant to live for. I'm supposed to live with him. And there's somewhere I started believing a lie and I, I'm being pulled out of, tempted to live outside of the tree of life, outside of my relationship with him, okay? So here's the key to to understanding righteousness is you don't have to sin. Now Jesus has covered your sin, but you don't have to go there and it is never better for you that you do. You don't need like a hall pass on sin to say, well, this one time I can make an exception because it's expedient that I do it this way. It'll never be better for you than choosing righteousness, never. It is always a trap. Now, it's tempting. It's temptation because it's tempting, right? Like, so it's going to look good. It's like Adam and Eve said in the garden, or Eve said in the garden, it's like it was pleasing to the eye, and so I ate it. It was offering me something that I thought I didn't have, though we know she actually did have. She was already created in the image of God. So she wouldn't be like God by eating it. So temptation is always alluring you into trying to get something quickly and expediently and illegitimately. Okay, righteousness. Now, peace. You know what peace is, right? Maybe you just, you've never experienced peace, but you just at least have an idea of what peace is. So you weren't created to live in anxiety. And you were not created to live in fear. Some of you wrestle with anxiety Many of us wrestle with anxiety. Anxiety has visited me a time or two today, okay? Anxiety is not what I was created for. 
It's not the way that I'm supposed to live. And when I experience anxiety, what it does is that my thoughts about reality begin to take shape without God's presence. And I begin to imagine a future without him. The interesting thing about peace is that the word peace here is the word shalom. Say shalom. Shalom. That's a good word. Shalom is what Jesus had in the boat in the storm. He slept in the middle of the storm while his disciples were going crazy. Why? Because he had shalom. He then wakes up, or he actually is woken up, because they're afraid, and they're trying to get their fear onto him. Have you ever been around people that are like, I'm afraid, I need you to be afraid too, that way at least I won't be afraid of my fear, or alone in my fear? If, if not, then you may actually be the one pulling people into your fear. We hate to be alone, so we pull people into our dysfunction a lot of the time. And so, Jesus woke up. He actually rebuked the disciples first. He's like, what are you doing waking me up? I was taking a good nap. Who hates being woken up from a good nap, right? And then he says to the storm, shalom, peace, be still. Here's how you know you're walking in the shalom of God. You see, the shalom or the peace of the world is circumstantial. I'm good if the world around me is good. But the peace of God, the shalom of heaven, is the peace of God, the power of God that calms storms and drives out chaos. So you actually have the power of God within you if you're a child of God to happen to your circumstances to bring peace to your storms. You don't need for everybody to be like tiptoeing around you for you to have peace. Instead, you carry peace with you and it begins to set the world at peace. Okay? So that's what you're you're promised if you're a citizen of heaven. And then the third is joy. Anybody like joy? Joy is different than happiness. As I've dug into joy, one of the things that I'm convinced of is that joy is related to our awareness of the presence of God. I love what one of our apostolic advisors, Muzz, says. Muzz will be with us actually for the men's deal in November, November 11th, if you're looking to put it on your calendar, I think, or 9th, November 9th. And uh, Muzz, he says a few things about joy. He's like always full of joy. And it's not fake joy. You've been around fake joy? It's like people that are laughing, but it's an uneasy laughter, and you're like, oh, that's hard. Real joy. He says this, when is the last time that you were full of joy and sinned? It's impossible, impossible. Why? Because when you're aware of the presence of God, you don't want anything else. Another thing that he's said over and over again to us throughout the years is he said that the joyful you is the real you. What if you started to believe that? What if you started to not tolerate anything else but that? Let's take it to those other two. What if we begin to understand that no matter what your experience has been, the peaceful you, the at rest you is the real you. And what if no matter what habits and dysfunctions you found yourself caught up in, what if the righteous you, you begin to understand that was the real you? Like that's not what I was, the old has gone, the new has come. And so, I use those three because they're very easy to detect in my own life. And I, whenever I experience myself outside of those three, when, whenever temptation becomes tempting, whenever I lose my peace, usually it feels like anxiety uh, or fear. Uh, and, and whenever I'm lacking in joy, I realize it's like the, the lights on my dashboard going off. Doesn't tell me what's wrong, but it tells me something that is wrong. Now, most of us spiritually will have at least at some point in our time lived with the lights on the dashboard on and called it normal. And if you're really religious, here's what you do you take some tape and you stick it over the light and you pretend that it's not there. Because religion is a mask that hides where you're really hurting and hides where you're absolutely alone. 
And here, I mean alone in the worst way, when you're alone and you're feeling isolated from God. And it's not that God isn't there, it's that you're not plugged in, turned on to experience his awareness. So what I do is I'm like, okay, something feels off, now I'm going to do some diagnostics. Now for me, practically, when the dashboard lights go on, I drive over to AutoZone and they do a free test and they give me a big report and I figure out what's wrong there, right? Spiritually, when I do that, I, I sit down and here's what I don't do. I don't sit in this chair. I'm not trying to figure it out to get to God. I'm sitting down and I'm discerning with God, hey, what's going on? Because he knows me better than I know myself. The problem, this is where a lot of the church lives when it comes to to sin and even our mental health. We live in this place trying to get it all together without God. It's so self-reliant. And here's what it feels like. It's, it, it's a lot of introspection. It's just like I'm studying. You, like, you almost become obsessed with yourself. Like let me figure out what's going on. And let me figure out. And let me try to control all of these things around me. Oh, and church here, I, I love spiritual disciplines. They're great at guarding your devotion. Right? Like discipline in my relationship with Lauren. There's some disciplines that I have in order to guard my devotion, but they'll never replace my devotion. They'll just protect it. And sometimes we want spiritual disciplines to make us feel like we're living in the tree of life, and yet there's no life in it. It'll protect my devotion, but it'll never provide it. Why? Because I'm transformed by being with him. And so we live in this place of introspection. It's like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And and I'm a, a big fan of of inner healing and discipleship and counseling and all of those things, casting out demons, like all of that stuff is good. You need, you need some of that, but you can live in a perpetual place of something is wrong with me and it will cause you to avoid the responsibility of walking with God because we just are perpetually trying to fix something, and so we need everything to be broken. And so we then develop what I talked about last week, this codependent relationship with God, where it's like we only know how to connect with God in the middle of a problem. That's like the first couple years of marriage for Lauren and I. We've shared this story with some of you, most of you before, is that I was very self-reliant. So I'm like power through, rescuer, going to be the hero, and she was wrestling with self-condemnation, so she thought she always had the problem. And the hero always needs to find somebody with the problem. And so we made a really good match in order to be miserable. (laughs) Right? Like it was great because at the beginning I I got to be the hero rescuer. And then it was just not good at all. And, And not only that, laced in the middle of all of that is her believing that she doesn't have anything to offer and that she's weak. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And we often do our relationship with God that way that he's... The hero, and he is, and he is the rescuer, but he's not just the the hero and the rescuer, rescuer, he's also my life and my friend. Like, he's my best friend, and I want to live life with him, and I don't want him or need him only when there's a problem, though I surely do in those moments. I also just want to enjoy living life with him, and that's what transforms me to being like him because I then become sensitive to what he becomes sensitive to. I begin to process with him. So here's what I do. Okay, so if I notice the dashboard lights blinking and it's like something's wrong, righteousness, peace, joy, something's out of source. You start adding more than three things and you've got too big of a dashboard to keep track of, right? And so I say, okay, what happened? What changed? Like what was the circumstance? When was I okay and when did I stop being okay? The second question I ask is what lie am I believing? Because I know this. The enemy's authority is based on getting us to agree with a lie. And so he lies and is the father of lies because in our agreement we give him our authority. And so he begins to mess with us when we begin to make an agreement. For most of us, the agreements that we make with the enemy in our daily lives are often subconscious patterns that we've established or even inherited. And so it takes paying attention, taking those, like 2 Corinthians 10 would say, taking those thoughts captive, saying, what's going on? How did I get here? And then 
So, so I'm asking, what's the lie? And the lie is going to happen in one of those four places we talked about earlier. My beliefs about me, my beliefs about God, my beliefs about my circumstances, or my beliefs about others. Where did that lie creep in, and where did it begin to steal my righteousness, peace, and joy? And then, finally, here's where I land, because I don't want to stay stuck in the, like, dealing with the painful stuff. I actually want to find the truth. What, John, what Jesus says in John 8, 32 is that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let me explain to you this key of knowing the truth. The truth is not simply a concept. It's not an idea. It's not a thought. The truth is a person. And so when I begin to understand the person of Jesus in the middle of my pain, I become, it's an invitation for me to be with him and I'm transformed by being with him. As I camp out on the truth, what God by his spirit will unveil to me is the truth that begins to extinguish the lies about me, him, my circumstances, or others. And so I camp out on the truth, and I let the truth set me free. You see, oftentimes, the enemy attacks you in the liability closest to your strength. Oftentimes... His attacks that we give into are using our strengths out of bounds. And when we give into those things, what we find is that the, the religious mind wants to just cut off all of that stuff instead of sort through it, do surgery, remove the cancer, find the life. And so the invitation is actually to camp out on the truth. And so what I do is when I find that thing It's like that cancer that's robbing me. I begin to camp out on the truth that sets me free. Does that make sense? So it's like, oh man, I lost my peace because my bank account hit zero. You've been there before? Not a great place to be, right? And you're like, oh. Well, the problem is, is that I'm still stuck thinking in the natural realm instead of the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm exists to, and, and transforms the natural realm. So I need to set my things on a, things above, not below, and I need to realize what God's doing in the middle of all of that stuff. And once I do, I get my peace back. And so often, we become slaves and victims to our circumstances because we don't realize where God is in the middle of all of our stuff. And when we can find where he is in the middle of our stuff, we get transformed by being with him in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our anxiety, the middle of our brokenness, the middle of our chaos. And that's what changes us, and that's how we begin to live seated in the tree of life. And here's the great thing. In Revelations, it talks about how the tree of life is in heaven. So it still exists. It's in heaven. It's on both sides of the river of life. So it's like the river of life is flowing through the tree of life. And on its leaves are healing or on its leaves are is the healing for the nations. So when I begin to live seated in the tree of life, seated in God as a child of God, as his kid, then what he produces in me is fruit and healing for the nations. It begins to transform the people around me because I'm so rooted in him. And then here's the great thing. Many of you have been through excruciating pain, traumatic circumstances. It's been tough. What God does is he redeems those places of brokenness and gives you leaves that begin to heal nations, that begin to heal others, that begin to to bring life into other places. Worship team, you guys can come back up. Natalie, I've got a word for you. Uh, I've watched your femininity, the the strength you have as a woman, be under attack for, for as long as I've known you. And what I've seen in the last two years, three years, is you allow God to transform that in you so that you now have healing for the nations. 
and that your, your femininity is not a liability, it's actually a strength. And it's, it's a unique way that you display who God is. And now you're entering a season where God's going to use that. You're, it, it, the tree's growing leaves, and you're going to use that to heal other people as you walk in who God has made you to be. Would you close your eyes? Here's the thing. God is speaking to each one of us. You don't need me to give you a word for you to hear from God. In fact... It's better for you that you hear it straight from God. So you just say, God, what are you, what are you doing in my heart right now? Lord, I thank you for the invitation for us, again, just to lay down our performing and striving to rest in the life that you've given us. Thank you for giving us life. I just want to minister to people in one of three places just for a second. I know I'm going long. Hang in there with me. You've been wrestling with righteousness, like sin is kicking your tail. And I just sense this, I know this to be true, eternally true of God, but I also know it to be for this like very specific moment that God is giving people his righteousness. That robe that in Luke 15, the prodigal son got put on him. Just sense that God wants to do that for you. And so if that's where you are, just to say, God, I'm tired of trying to be good enough for you. Trying to perform for you and for my past sin, for letting that haunt me for my whole life. I sense this, that God is just wanting you to know that he forgives you. He forgives you. And he marks you as innocent. The slate has been wiped clean. There are others of you that you really wrestle with peace. I sense God giving you his peace. And if that's where you are, just where, just where you're sitting, just put your hands in front of you and I just want to bless you with the shalom of God. Just declare peace to you, saturating your heart and your mind. And then third, some of you, you have, you have been robbed of your joy. You experience moments and seasons of happiness, but if you're to be real honest, you just don't have joy. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's your superpower. You're never stronger than when you're full of joy. So I just bless you with the grace of God that would produce joy in you. you would be aware and connected to him. Apart from performance and striving. Finally, you may be here this morning and you just need to say yes to Jesus. You need to entrust your life to him. You're tired of doing the whole self-centered thing and you want to give your life to him. And We've got a ministry team that'll be up here. They'll be praying for people just that need some prayer for whatever is going on in their life. Maybe it's sickness, maybe it's hard circumstances. Maybe you just need some breakthrough. Um, And if you want to to come forward and just say, tell them, hey, I I want to give my life to Jesus. And they'll they'll walk you through what that looks like and where you go from here. I just wanna, wanna invite the ministry team forward.
thank you that today you're inviting prodigals home. Like you may just feel like you've been running far from God doing your own thing. And I just sense God saying today is a good day to come home, to move back into the family house, to be in the house of God. So Lord, we thank you for your work in our lives. Thank you for your presence with us as we go.